Hey everybody, this is Zach Dittmars. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Live with Lenny. For this installment, we will be discussing 10 ways to be a better fish hunter. So you catch fish where you find fish, and if you can't find them, you can't catch them. So tonight we'll discuss 10 fish hunting tips, some for fishing from a boat and some for fishing from land, which will help you hunt down more of those finned critters this fall. I'd like to thank Suzuki for sponsoring this episode. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome our angler in chief, Mr. Lenny Rudo. Hey, Lenny. Hey, Zach. How you doing? Doing great. So, can I just point out real quick? We're sponsored this month by Suzuki, right? Suzuki's been a great supporter of Fish Talk through the years. Great engine manufacturer. I've had many. Just the other day, you were on the brand new boat powered by the Suzuki 300. And we had, what do we have? Uh, six people aboard that's right six people aboard on a 26 footer did you notice what the gps said when i opened it up and let the suzuki eat yeah i think you're pushing 40 40 plus 46 46 46 with six people aboard and a full tank of fuel and full gear oh gotta love it gotta love it certainly is a change from the old glacier bay and her 22 not too shabby and we were uh we're able to run quite a bit, you know, zip around yeah. and find the fish. Yeah, we're having fun. And we're going to talk about finding the fish. But before we roll into it all, I just want to remind folks, a couple quick items. Uh, fish for Cures this weekend. I want to personally thank everybody who has chipped in to Team Pro uh, Fish Talk Prop Talk. We greatly appreciate it. There is no better cause. This money is going to directly help people who are in the fight against cancer. It really is important. And uh, it's really gratifying that folks chipped in. Um, you know, I wish I could thank everybody personally. I, I can't. I, I, it would take too long. But I want to note that there were several folks from the uh, Anglers Annapolis Club who chipped in generously. Uh, oh, my gosh. We had great support from the Ken Island fishermen. Um, and Bert Olmstead, thank you, Bert. Thanks so much to the club. Uh, it, it really is fantastic to see everyone chipping in. And. There is another tournament benefiting charity that's going off. Uh, well, gosh, it's already started. We're in November. It's the Evan Foundation Tournament, which the Annapolis Anglers play a large role in. I think a lot of those guys are in it. It runs through the entire month. So, folks, if you are looking for excuses to continue fishing as much as possible through the month of November, this is a great one. Uh, let's see. I had a couple other things noted down and I can't read them without my glasses. Oh, the pickerel tournament. Let's not forget the CCA, uh, pickerel championship winter pickerel championship is now underway. Uh, runs through February. It's a lot of fun people. I do this one. I'm really not a tournament guy, but I do this one because I really just have such a good time. And Zach, you're the one who dragged me kicking and screaming into it in the first place. Aren't you? Uh, yeah. You know, it's, there's that, no that way to, to get motivated to get out of the house and fish all winter long. All winter. That was you. you all on you. Uh, so the next time my wife complains about how I'm fishing too much in the middle of January, I'm blaming you. But it really is fun. It really is a good time. Oh, oh, and we should also mention, uh, go to Angler Sports Center if you – oh, gosh, I don't want to get this wrong. I think it's if you spend 75 bucks on Daiwa gear. Any right? Daiwa product. I Any think. product, then you are automatically entered into their Calcutta, and you can win some pretty tremendous Daiwa rod and reel combos. Uh, do you remember which one? It was they're, like their top of the line stuff. You can win their top of the line stuff. Uh, the uh, there's three um, three prizes in the Angler's Daiwa Calcutta. So seventy five dollars in Daiwa products. You can do it any time throughout the next four months. Um, You'll get a, with that, you get a hat, a CCA Daiwa pickerel hat. Um, and then the first prize is a Zillion SV with a Taptula XT. And that's a $500 retail value. Uh, second is a Cage MQ with a Taptula XT. And third is a Fuego LT 2500 with a Taptula XT. So some really cool stuff. Um, Very nice. Very nice. Okay. And uh, let's see. Oh, and we should also mention Tochterman's sponsors the fly category. 
Now, I'm not a fly guy. I'm not fishing in the, in the fly category, but I love the Tachterman's folks. They are the nicest people in the world. Uh, and our own contributor, Eric Packard, has stated unequivocally that he is going to be fishing the fly category this year. He's going after it. So, Eric, I wish you luck. You won't be competing with me, but I wish you luck. So, actually, that's kind of good. I don't have to worry about Eric because last year, man, he racked them up, didn't he? He had the biggest kayak fish, I think, and the second biggest stringer overall. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. he had a really good year. And he fished every single day of that four-month period, I think. Yeah, probably you? so. I, you know, go figure. <laughs> All right, so before we jump into becoming a better fish hunter, there was one more thing I want to circle back to Fish for a Cure. Uh, we had our big fundraiser online on Facebook through the past week. It ended last night, and we had a couple items that didn't go. Zach, you want to put those items up on a slide there? Do you have a slide for this? Absolutely. But, you know, before we jump into that, I do want to, again, thank everyone that made that silent auction a huge success. It helped us reach our goal of over 10,000. I think we're 11,000. So all these brands, all these businesses contribute either products, goods, or services, or just a big old donation. So uh, thanks to everyone here um, for doing so. Um, couldn't have done it without you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Zach. So, uh, you know, Lenny, we didn't really discuss, but uh, so we do have some holdover products here. This is a Clarion uh, head unit of uh, CM20 with the CM SP651SWG. That's four speakers, and they come with either a white or a gunmetal sport grill, so you can kind of customize it. Uh, really good stuff. Maybe maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this product, Lenny. I think you're more familiar. So, yeah, that is a really sweet stereo system. I, I think I actually may have understated the, uh, the the value there. Go Google it and look it up. But the bottom line is it didn't get bid on, which honestly, it shocked me. Um, this easily should have gone for, you know, 500 bucks. But I'll tell you what, if you're watching right now and you're like, oh, I could use a stereo system for my boat, make us an offer. Pop it into the comments. Ignore the, the minimum bid that we had on there. You know, hey, maybe, maybe 200 bucks, right? Let's say 200 bucks. Pop it on into the comments right now. And Zach will communicate with you. And let's get these final items sold and push that money towards benefiting those cancer patients. What else we got, Zach? Oh, we got uh, from Hook Optics. These are the Yellowfin Polarized Sunglasses. And if anyone doesn't know, Hook Optics is a Maryland-based company out of Easton. Um, they actually are opticians. They do specialize in um, prescription lenses. They, you know, they have uh, some high quality stuff. I believe these are made in Italy. And uh, I think these are like a premium lens. It's got a tortoise shell uh, frame. They're pretty slick. And, and, and we should point out, you know, Hook donated several pairs of sunglasses. They had plenty of bids. All the others went. But we ended up with an extra. And, you know, we could send it back to the Hook folks, but they were so generous to give us those multiple pairs. Come on, people. Chip in 100 bucks. Do it, do it for the cause, right? Nope. What else we got? Uh, we got another pair of sunglasses. These are really sweet. I'm really, yeah. I, I can't. I can't get over that these didn't sell. I mean, most people don't know fit. Look. Uh huh. Uh huh. When I got my pair of test fin noors, like it was like a year ago, I actually like replaced my normal sunglasses with them. They are phenomenal. So if you're thinking about it, what's that say? Two thirty nine. Come on, people. Yeah. 80 bucks. Chip in. Come on, whatever. Right. Send a comment. Send a right, comment. Yeah. Send us a private message, and then we'll we'll tell you how to make a donation. We'll send you a link to donate to our Fish for Cure team page. And we need those donations pretty much by tomorrow, so about 24 hours from now. So you have 24 hours to think about. Um, up next, we got another. Eric donated a tremendous amount of artwork, some beautiful stuff. This is aerial, sort of abstract fishing boat center console um, we still have available. So if you're interested in decorating, you know, Another great piece. Eric does some really cool stuff. And it, it's 16 by 20. It looks a little small there, but so it actually is a pretty large painting. So, uh, And Eric donated a tremendous amount of artwork to the cause. He, he, he alone is responsible for a nice chunk of the earnings. Uh, again, this is one among many, but it didn't go. So come on, folks. Come on. Check it out. How cool is abstract art? I don't even know. I'm not an abstract guy. This one's not abstract, is it? Not. So we got a striper chasing bunker from Ian Rubin, who's very talented lore maker. He started Lip Rippers Baits during the pandemic while he was 
on lockdown. He sold thousands of lures, and then he hung it up to go to college and get an education. I bet you'll see big things from him to come in the future. Ian was kind enough to send us a few lore packs with that's sold like hotcakes. And he also did this painting hand, hand done. Um, very cool. So if you're interested in this, just uh, send us a PM or DM or a uh, comment if you'd like to show your support. Again. Uh, you know, I got to say, um, I, ca I can't do this at the same time. I don't know how to log in and click there, but I'm doing 50 bucks right now. Someone beat me. Someone beat me, but I'm doing 50 bucks right now. Awesome. All right. What else we got, Zach? Is that it? That's a wrap. That's a wrap. There's That's the end of the over. So, um, again, thanks so much for anybody um, who participated in the silent auction or just sent a general donation. Um, Matt Baden, $60 on the uh, Eric Packard. Thank you, Matt. We really nice. appreciate the support. And uh, thanks for everything you do for Fish for a Cure all these years. And we're, yeah. we're really impressed with the uh, fundraising that you have done year after year. And uh, thank you. And also for managing the tournament Calcutta this year. He's taken on a new role. He just, you know, keeps giving more. So really appreciate awesome it. Awesome and excellent. Thank you, Matt. Very cool. All I, right. Well, I, I hear this our or... new fishing hideaway he's planning on. Uh, <laughs> lower, slower. All right. I'm waiting for the invite. I'm waiting for the invite. Peter, thank you. 75 for the striper on bunker. Very awesome. Great. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. So I'm glad. No one been on the so these things are awesome sunglasses. I, you know, I, I think I might have to buy some more sunglasses. So you never know. You never know how it's gonna go. All right, you ready to roll into uh let's do it. Give me slide number one. Got it. All right, people, let's talk about becoming a better fish hunter. Because, like Zach said at the beginning, if you can't find the fish, you can't catch the fish. You catch a fish where the fish are, right? But you gotta find them first. Now. I want you to look at this picture. Look at the background. <clears throat> Even uh, love the smiling face, love the fish. Look at the background. No birds, right? I took this picture on Saturday. There were birds working. There were birds working. But if you want to be a better fish hunter, as you pay attention to the birds, also pay attention to your fish finder. Way too many people just go roaring up to the birds. They stop. They start casting, right? Well, you know what? You've got current and wind to account for. So if your boat is parked down current of the birds and the fish are feeding up current, guess what? The fish aren't even within casting range. Okay. So when I'm working birds, the first thing I'm doing when I pull back the throttles is I'm looking at the fish finder. I'm not just going by the birds. Um, don't just follow the flocks. You really need to use your electronics at the same time. Now, this is particularly true in recent years when the birds, uh, they've just been acting downright funny, or at least the fish under the birds have been acting downright funny. They're up for 30 seconds. And by the time you get there, half the time, they've all sat down anyway. Okay. This I, I know you people have been seeing this. This is like a new thing on the bay. Four or five years ago, it started being this way and then two years ago it was completely this way this year it's completely this way the, the the fish are not staying up and feeding hard or they just aren't forming the mass schools that push all that bait up elevator fish i love it yeah yeah up and down very very brief showings on the birds so when you roll over there even if you get there when the birds are still working don't immediately start casting now's the time to start circling around Start looking for marks on the meter. Now, if you circle, you know, north of the flock of birds, right, and that's where you spot the fish, and you get a bite, and then it dies out, and then the birds come up over there. They, they hit up on the elevator again over there. When you go over there, what side are you going to go to? Go to the north side first, right, because you're probably going to find the same kind of thing. Stay on the move. Use those electronics. Don't stop until you actually see the fish on the meter which leads me to slide number two bring it on zach there it is uh oh man can you make that big make me the yeah thank you um use your chart plotter now this goes not only for your birds this this goes across the board really any fishing situation uh be really quick 
to make a new waypoint on the chart plotter. And I like this picture because you've got, th this is zoomed way in, and you've still got six waypoints right here. Those waypoints might only be, you know, 50 yards apart from each other. That's okay. Whenever you see something interesting on your meter, click that, that save button, make another waypoint there, and you'll notice some really interesting patterns. For example, you'll see waypoints that appear in clusters, like on the left side of the screen there. And you'll appear, you'll see some that appear in a line. Uh, those two on the right might be beginning to make a line. Um, something like an underwater ridge may become apparent. It might, might take two years of fishing in that area. But sooner or later, it, you know, it'll become apparent to you, hey, there's an entire ridge here. It might run for a quarter mile. Who knows, right? Um, it, it, it really is very illuminating if you continually save those waypoints and you'll get more and more spots to look for those fish and you'll become better and better at finding them. Now, piece and parcel with this. Zoom way in. Uh, it, it does not work nearly as well when you're using those waypoints if you're zoomed out. And I've been on plenty of boats where somebody shows half the Chesapeake Bay on their chart plotter to navigate to a general area and then they get there and they leave it like that. No, 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 no. Zoom it all the way in. You only, you know, man, a half a mile is a lot to be showing on the chart plotter when you're working on structure and waypoints. You want it really, really tight. When it's zoomed out, look, you set up your boat for a drift, it might appear on screen like your boat drifted right across the waypoint. Then you zoom in and you go, oh man, I missed it by a mile. You, you can't see until you zoom way, way, way in. So that's tip number two. All right, now, take me on to tip number three. I know Zach's going to love this one. <laughs> I, I wonder, I didn't tell him what it was, but I wonder if looking at the picture, he already knows what this slide represents. There it is. Zach, do you remember this day? Do you know what I'm about to say? Uh, I don't, but I do remember. I do remember the day. Okay, well, here's what I'm about to say. On the left, you see Zach not catching fish, standing in a spot, right? And I, I caught one you, fish over there. I caught one fish there. One, one fish. Okay, one fish. But I promise you folks, we have some free shoreline anglers too, and this is a great one. If you're not catching fish, move. Zach on the right is holding up a nice white perch. How many perch did you catch standing in that other spot, Zach? Too many to count. Too many to count. I believe that is an accurate summation. I remember this day well. If you were not standing over in that spot, you were not catching fish. Like, that's where they were. And you could have stood in that other spot and been Zach on the left all day long. You wouldn't have caught fish. Look, if you're not catching fish, move. So I remember the spot on the left had lots of lots of laid lay downs and trees, but the spot over on the right was the grasses, and that's where the fish were. So it was the, the you know that absolutely that day it was the it was the edge of the grass line. And when you dropped a white uh, a uh, grass shrimp on the edge of that grass line, you either caught a white perch or missed a bite. But if you fished by the lay downs, you weren't doing squat, and you know, every day is different. Fish do different things. They got tails. They move. They react differently to a bazillion different factors. So if you're not catching them, move, 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 move. Now go ahead and take me to the next slide, Zach. This is sort of in the same vein here, people. Uh, but when you're not catching fish, a way to hunt them down is to explore. Now, uh, this is a spot on the Patuxent. And this this picture was just taken a couple of years ago, but many years ago, it's an arm that comes into the Patuxent, a creek arm. And I never used to go up there. I had my spots on the upper Patuxent. I would go and fish them during the perch runs, and I do just fine. And uh, one day I, I was not doing just fine. I was spinning my wheels, not catching squat. I think I got a catfish or something, you know, maybe one little perch. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go explore. I'm not catching fish anyway. And I went exploring, and it resulted in a pile of perch like this one. Um, I just went up that arm and looked around and said, oh, I'll fish in this bend here. What the heck? Nothing happened. Went up a little farther. Oh, I'll fish along this edge. Nothing happened. What the heck? 
oh, I'll keep exploring, went up a little farther, boom, there they were. Um, if you don't explore new places, you're not going to find lots of fish. And here's the thing. You might have a great bunch of old reliable type spots, but, uh, you know, spots dry up. I know you've seen this, right? Um, spots dry up. They, they, you know, I, I tried to say this in my Chesapeake guide. Most good hot spots are good like two or three years out of every five. Decent hot spots are good like one year out of five. It's very rare to find a hot spot that's good three or four years out of five. And you never, they don't exist that are good five out of five. And, and some people are going to say, what about like, hey, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge? Well, guess what? Most years it holds fish. Some years it holds decent fishing. Some years great fishing. Some years not so good fishing. Even a spot like that. So when you're not catching them, forget about all those hot, old hot spots. Go explore. This dovetails right into our next one. Go ahead and pop it up there if you would, please, Zach. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So before I say exactly what it is, I got to do a brief introduction. Many of you guys already know. This is uh, Pete Dahlberg, Walleye Pete, right? And this is a picture I took on his boat, holding up a couple specks. And I have to give credit for this tip to Pete. He's the one who. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that was perfect, Zach. How did you know? Sorry about that. that. How did you know? Sorry about that. No, that was perfect. Do it oh. again. Huh? Do it again. I want to know. Beautiful. The tip is burn more gas. When Pete is not catching fish, he'll he'll always tell you. He'll tell you if you could ask him tomorrow, call him up right now and say, Pete, what's your best tip for catching fish? And he'll be like, burn more gas. It's true. Um, and I gotta credit him with phrasing it so eloquently. When you're not, you know, look, you can have a great spot that maybe it's good that particular year. You can have a great spot that's been good. And you go there and you don't catch fish. Well, maybe the tide's wrong. Maybe the current, you know, the current just isn't hitting it right. Maybe for whatever fish, for whatever reason, the fish like it when the light levels are low, but they don't like it when the light levels are high. Uh, you know, there, there are a gazillion different reasons. A pressure change sent them out of the area. Who knows? For whatever reason, if you're not catching fish, a great tip is burn more gas. It was very good timing. I'm highly impressed by Zach tonight. I don't know how he came up with that, but that's awesome. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next one. And as we do so, I'm just going to mention, because I didn't at the start, I forgot to tell people. Uh, most of you probably know this. But if you have any questions that come up at any point, feel free to drop them into the comments. Um, it, it's cool if Zach interrupts me with questions. I love it. We want to know what you want to know. Feel free to drop those questions into the comments at any time. He'll field them and pass them on. All right. So here we have a picture of a big giant pack of boats. Uh, boats attract boats. There can be one guy, and he might not even be catching anything. And another guy cruising by goes, oh, I wonder what he's doing, and cruises over there and starts fishing him around him. And before guy number two can realize that there are no fish there, guy number three goes, ooh, those boats are close together. I'm running over there. The next thing you know, you got a pack of 40 boats. And it doesn't even matter if there are fish there or not. Now, this isn't always true. Of course, you got your times like in the summertime when the fish were piled up, you know, off of off of Tolchester, Wharton Point pools, those zones. You ended up with a big stack of boats, and you know, many of the people were catching fish. And that's great. But as a general rule of thumb, don't just go running for the pack. Avoid the pack. Once you get into this pack mentality. Now, all of a sudden, within X distance, I don't know, half a mile, whatever, you've got 100 hooks competing with your hooks. There may be fish there, but your chances of catching them are now going to be lower than if you had just found your own spot. Okay? So uh, this, this is a tough one, particularly for beginners to break away from, because beginners often are really, they question themselves. They're not sure where to go. 
and following the pack kind of seems like the easy way out. But I'm telling you right now, if you can force yourself to just break away from that and get away from that pack, it may take some time. It may take some, uh, let's see, moving, exploring, burning gas. But eventually, you'll hunt down more fish. All right. Go ahead and to the, take me to the next one, if you would, please, Zach. So here we have a picture of a stereo on a uh, boat. Why did I put this here? Um, you need to eliminate all those distractions. If you're jamming out the tunes while you're allegedly hunting for fish, you're being distracted. Uh, if you're sitting there chugging beer, honestly, you're being way distracted. So I like tunes. I like listening to the stereo on my boat. Zach, can you please paraphrase for everybody when the stereo is on and when it is absolutely off on my boat? I believe it's connected to your throttle. Uh, at 3,000 RPMs, the stereo kicks on at about 3,000 decibels. <laughs> That's accurate. When we're running the boat, we're not actually fishing. I'm happy to jam the tunes. I love to. When I pull those throttles back and start hunting for fish, it goes off. It doesn't even go down. It goes off. It is absolutely off. And uh, I consider that a, a critical component of hunting fish because if I'm not focused on my fish finder, on my binoculars, uh, on what's going on around me, then I'm not being the most efficient fish, fish hunter possible. So kill that stereo. Get, get rid of all those distractions. Uh, really focus in. And that will help you find more fish. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so this is a picture from an eastern shore mill pond. And as you can see, the angler is nowhere near shore. It's actually more extreme than it looks. Like he's like three casting distances from the shoreline. And a lot of people would say you're going pickerel fishing. Well, you know, look for the laydowns on the shoreline, right? And then they got a point. Often you'll find fish there, but you also need to do what really looks to be unlikely if you want to, to, to be the best fish hunter you can. And uh, this is David, one of my sons. He was out there in the middle of the lake, in the middle of nowhere, and that's where he was catching fish. And it seems unlikely, but in the eastern shore mill ponds, this is often the case. You'll often find fish out in the middle of nowhere. Now, there are these little weed beds in a lot of these ponds that are out in the middle and the fish like to hang in them. Well, if you just fish the shoreline, because everybody always says always fish the shoreline, and you didn't decide to look in the most unlikely place in the lake, guess what? You wouldn't be catching fish like this. So this, this goes across the board for all different fishing scenarios. The Eastern Shore mill ponds are just a really good example of it. Look in those unlikely places where you think, man, there's no way. I'm not going to catch fish there. And you know what? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. You don't want to spend a ton of time out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but check them out. You know, check those spots out because you just never know when that's going to lead to fish. Whew. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Here's another one for shoreline anglers. So this is a tip that I'm sure I learned years ago, and then I kind of forgot about. And then I got reminded when Jack here was wearing his waders. And then Eric Packard's also reminded me this lately with some of the fishing he does. Uh, if you're fishing a shoreline, grab a pair of waders. Bring them along. It lets you get to a whole lot of territory that everybody else standing on the shoreline who doesn't have waders can't even hope to get to. Now, you can see in this example right here, he's not far from the shoreline right? But taking two steps off of that shoreline allowed him to cast, whereas on the shore, he couldn't have casted, at least not much, because of the canopy. The, the trees are coming right down towards the water there. So he took a few steps out. Now he can cast all around. Uh, there are a lot of public access areas where that pair of waders is going to let you move 50 feet, 30 feet, from where everybody else fishes on a daily basis. And that can just be gold. 
Um, that, that is a really big, here's another great example on the Magathy of Beechwood. Um, you'll see people there fishing with waders who take 10 steps out from the shoreline and they're catching fish. And you'll see people who are standing on the shoreline who don't have waders and they're not catching very many fish. Um, there, there, there are a million examples of this. If you're a shoreline angler, get a pair of waders, wear them. Uh, of course, you know, in the, in the middle of the summer, you can wait out anyway. But springtime, fall, when it's chilly out, the waders will greatly expand your ability to get out and touch some spots, some water that everybody else just can't get to. All right, let's go to the next slide here, please. Then we have a surprise bonus slide. Oh, you went backwards, dude. Oh, <laughs> hi, Dave. <laughs> All right, so that was funny. Uh, so. This is a picture of the screenshot from uh, Sirius XM fish mapping. And these pink circles here, what they're doing is they're showing you where the marine biologists, they look at the satellite data, believe you're likely to find kingfish. So it's a pretty, you know, spectacularly advanced tech to be using when you're fishing. Uh, there are some other great examples, uh, certainly real-time fish finders, side finders. I've been using the, the Humminbird Apex system for, well, a couple of weeks now. It's what I've got on my new Camus, and uh, it, it has been an eye-opener. I'm seeing fish that I never saw before. That is for sure, uh, particularly with the side scanner. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, a lot of people say it's cheating. Like using tech like that is cheating, right? You, you know, it's too much. I get emails. We had a letter to the editor uh, in last month's edition from someone who said, oh, it's become too easy to catch fish with all these electronics. Well, look, I remember when I was a kid and we didn't have this stuff. And we had some great fishing days and we had some days we bombed. Today, I've got all this stuff. And you know what? I have some great fishing days and I have some days that I bombed. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is this stuff helps. But it does not automatically mean you're going to catch a bazillion fish. So I do not call it cheating. I call it using tech to my advantage. Um, and it does give you an advantage. You know, quick little, quick little, let, look, that's it. Okay. You take your car to a mechanic. Would you like him to not use the tech at his disposal? You go to a doctor. Would you like them to not use the tech at their disposal because it's cheating? All that laparoscopic stuff, that's cheating. I mean, come on, people. Uh, use the tech that is available to you and at your fingertips. It's not cheating. And you're still going to have some days you bomb. I hate to tell you, fish are creatures. Sometimes they just don't bite. Um, you know, if it's there and it's legal, I say, hey, go for it. It's helpful. All right, Zach, should we go to our bonus slide for the evening? People, use the Fish Talk Fishing Reports. Uh, our, our guy, Dylan Waters, is doing a phenomenal job at gathering intel. He is calling, emailing, and texting more people than I guarantee you you'll ever dream about attempting to get in touch with every week, putting these reports together. You add on top of that all the read reports. Folks who are emailing me and people, please, I love them. Keep them coming. Lenny at fishtalkmag.com. Email me, send me a picture. Just let me know the basics. You know, you don't have to, you know, be super duper in detail, but it's great when we can share what you folks are catching, uh, what kind of lures and what kind of depths. It's great intel. And you know what? If you go check these reports every week, it will help you become a better fish hunter. I guarantee it. It absolutely is very, very helpful. I, I check them. I check. I put them up every week when I put them up. I'm like, I'm come, I'm paying attention. Believe me, okay? And I also put in my own reports. You'll see almost every week. Uh, it's rare that a week goes by that I don't chip in my two cents on what I encountered throughout the past week, whether I was in the upper bay, middle bay, lower bay, freshwater, whatever I might be doing. So, uh, and it, you can't really see it in the screenshot, but um, when you go to the fishing reports, uh, what does it say, Zach? Is it sign up here? I think it says sign up here. Uh, you can click to get uh, a reminder every week 
when the reports go live. And you'll just get an email uh, when the report goes live Friday at noon that says, hey, Fish Talk Fishing Reports are up. Come on, check me out. Woo, it helps. All right, so hopefully all those 10 tips will help everybody be better fish hunters. I love it when people say that fish talk is helping them catch more bigger fish. Uh, Zach, are we questionless at this point? Um, yeah, you know, not too many questions. Uh... That's kind of a shocker. I don't know if I'll ever have gotten all the way through 10 slides. Well, this week plus a bonus slide without any questions popping up. So people, if you got anything on your mind you want to ask about, you can ask about the current fishing conditions, uh, whatever, feel free to pop them into those comments right now. And I'm going to take a quick gulp of drink. Hmm. Woo. So, uh, so let's see here. Uh, earlier, Darius B, he, he said, uh, I think he was referring to the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He needs to start following the pack of woods because he might have a better shot. So. so, you know, it's a common temptation. It really is. Um, but in the long run, most of the time, you'll you'll find it really is not helpful, in my opinion. Um, you'll also find it a lot less aggravating when you're not fishing around a pack of boats. That can be painful when you're not catching, especially when you hear the cheers going up from all the other boats. I know everyone's been there. I've been there. When, you know, when you're not catching and everybody else is yelling and hooting and hollering, it's just like, oh, geez, man, what am I doing wrong? Um, but, you know, and again, like I said, there are exceptions. There are certain times and certain places when the fish are really piled in and they aren't elsewhere. And if you want to catch them, you kind of got to go there. Um, but just as a general rule of thumb, I, I, I'm telling you, man, do the explore thing. Do the burn gas thing. Um, do, you know. Uh, get rid of the distractions and focus and start hunting around and you'll eventually you're going to find it. it will happen <clears throat> comment from uh pertaining to this topic so get to know the charter boats that produce if they're in that pack it might be worth checking out and uh it's a good point so that's an interesting point um I'm sure the charter guys don't love hearing that. I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of want to argue that a little bit because uh, what kind of fisherman are you? If you're a jigger and you see a charter boat live line and it's a really good charter boat and they're banging on the fish, should you get over there and jig? I'm going to say no. You're, you're not likely to catch. When you got a bunch of boats that are dropping down live spot, Man, jigging can be non-productive. Now, that's not always the case, but that that happens. That absolutely happens. Um, is the charter boat trolling for mackerel? Well, if they are, you better have the right planers, leaders, spoons on board, because if you don't, you can go around and troll the same zone that they're catching fish after fish in all day long, pulling other stuff, and you're not going to catch a fish. So I guess there are times when that, you know, is going to be accurate, but I'm going to argue that that's not always the case. There, there, you know, there are a lot of variables there. Um, my, my, one of my sons, uh, Max, not David, who was on the kayak earlier on the kayak picture, uh, his brother, his twin, uh, made it on the big worm, uh, last summer. And one of the things that was really illuminating to me was the, the, some of the stuff that he was doing, um, particularly live lining, uh, which I just, I kind of, I don't know, man. I don't like to do it anymore. I pulled up one too many rockfish streaming blood out of its gills. I just can't bring myself to these days. Um, but they were going out and catching a bunch of fish every day. And I knew where they were going. Shh, don't tell Captain Drew. Max told me. Shh. Uh, I knew where they were going, but I knew what they were doing. And I knew I could be right next to them jigging. and it, Probably would have been non-productive, you know, in all likelihood. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it. You know, I guess that's that. You know, that's one of the things about fishing. There, there's no right or wrong. There really isn't. There's a lot of considerations to take in, and um, you know, you can't argue with a full fish box. So, 
So Peter says he and his brother out a few weeks ago and stayed away from the packs. Interesting to see the pack come to you. Proves your point. One or two and then three. Felt good to start the pack. Yeah. So, I mean, that'll happen. That's absolutely true. It, it, I've seen this happen time and time again where there's one boat. And maybe I'm fishing, you know, a mile away, something like that. But I can see it. And I see a boat cruising and you see him stop. And then 10 minutes later, you see another boat cruising and then they stop. And then 10 minutes later, you see another boat. And Next thing you know, there's five, six, eight boats there. And you think, am I crazy? And you go, I got to go over there and check it out. And you go over there and check it out. And they're all like floating there. Bored. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. But it, it, you can watch it happen. Hey, Kevin. Uh, like to hear from anglers who had a bad day. That, oh, my God, that is so true. So Kevin is pointing out the fact that I like to hear from anglers who had a bad day because it helps with spotting trends. It also helps, like, give us all a dose of reality because when you ask people for reports, 9 out of 10 only give you a report when they have a great day and they've got the, the bragging rights and the fish picks, and that's cool. But, you know, for every one of them, there's, you know, when some days there are going to be 10 anglers out there who spun their wheels all day long and didn't do a darn thing. And uh, <clears throat> they rarely send in the reports. So I really love it when people send me a report and say, hey, you know what? We fished Eastern Bay all day long. All we caught was two dinks. Um, that's a great report to get. And you'll see it in the fishing reports. It'll say, you know, a reader checked in and said X. Um, and the fact that the, the rareness that you see that with tells you just how few of those reports I get. And by the way, Kevin, thank you for your support in Fish for a Cure. I noticed. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, please send those reports when you don't catch anything. Let me know what you were doing and kind of where you were. And uh, that's extremely helpful. And it's not, you know, it's not like just helpful to me. It's helpful to all the anglers out there. It really is. It's, it's very important. <clears throat> Eric's asking any spot left out there. Eric, I have not heard about any in Maryland waters in, in, over, in over a week now. So I'm going to say probably not. Uh, if you want to go live lining, go catch some white perch. Little white perch, honest to God, they work pretty much as well as spot do. Like a lot of people sell them short. But there was a time, I want to say it was three years ago, when the spot only went so far up the bay. <clears throat> they didn't get way, way up north. And the guys fishing up north, like, kind of resorted to using white perch. And it, it became the thing. Everybody was using white perch. It, it works. Works really well. Uh, when I was young, we used to take a pair of scissors, a pair of shears, and snip off their dorsal uh, under the theory that that would make it easier for the rockfish to eat the perch. I've since come to the conclusion that that's completely unnecessary. They eat them. And actually, interesting point. Saturday, I cleaned a 24-inch rockfish. And in its belly, there was about a 6-inch white perch. No bunker. He had a big old white perch in him. In fact, it's, it's very interesting. I, I took out a, a couple of really big crews of anglers, both Saturday and Sunday. Who were not experienced people. They 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 were having fun. It was, it was an awesome time, but they weren't you know fishermen. You know they were people who thought it'd be fun, and I was kind of introducing them to it. And a lot of people wanted to take home fish, so we ended up. I ended up cleaning eleven fish over the weekend, and I found the white perch and two bay anchovies in the bellies of these fish. Now this is November. Well, end of October, beginning of November here, right? Was the weekend November yet? I'm not sure. Might have been the end of October. Anyway, those fish should have been packed with bunker. And guess how many bunker I pulled out of 11 fish? Goose egg. Not a zip zilch. Zero. So not a good sign. Um, anyway, so Mike's chiming in here and asking, are the mouths of the rivers still prime spots or have the bunker exited the rivers yet? Uh, it's a mix right now, Mike. <clears throat> One of my spots at the mouth of the West has been producing steadily. It has been producing slightly smaller fish, but it's been producing steadily with some bigger ones. Um, 
out in the main stem bay though uh is is where i've been catching more uh fish of significant size lately um uh, doesn't mean you're not going to get a big one in the mouth of the rivers um but it seems to me that the bulk of the fish hanging in the river mouths right now you're, you're talking like 15 to 22 inches there are a couple 25s around whereas out in the main stem bay it's more like 18 to 25 inches and a couple bigger fish around you know so um and and, and i'm going to add to that the, the mouths of the rivers didn't see the run of fish in october that i would like to see they didn't last year either at least not around here i haven't heard of anything chop tank patuxen it could be different there i don't have any personal experience there in the last few weeks, um, I haven't heard anything, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Uh, same with the mouth of the Magathy, mouth of the Chester. Normally, those spots should all have been on fire for a couple of weeks now. Doesn't seem to be happening. The bunker have not all pushed out of the river, though. All that said, there are still bunker in the river. I'm, I, I'm seeing them on the way out and on the way in. The bunker aren't real, real clustered together. There's a little patch here, a little patch there. Um, but a neighbor of mine who lives on Ramsey Lake, um, which is a creek off of the South River, he was saying they were still in there last week. He was still seeing them around his dock. So, And also the water temperature is 60. So it hasn't really gone down far enough to, to force all those bunker out of the rivers. Who knows? Maybe we'll see a push at the mouths the next week or two here. We get a couple cold nights. Those fish in the main stem bay may move in a little bit. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see. Mm -hmm. So we, we got quite a few questions rolling in. So uh, we might have to start lightning round a little bit to get through in the next 10 minutes. But uh, since you mentioned the Camus a few times, Gary asked, uh, what, what size boat did you buy and what river are you at? I'm out of the South River. I bought a Camus 26 HB. Uh, if I was sitting in Zach's seat, I could bring up a picture real quick. But I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, look at it. Well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Got a 300 Suzuki on the back. Um, you you can see pictures of it on Fish Talk coming soon. Hint, hint. You'll see some some pictures coming soon in Fish Talk. Nice. All right. Um, so let's just go on this. I, I could try to group things in, but uh, I think it's going to be easier if we lot, – a lot of stuff flowed in. Thanks, for everyone, for uh, – for, lightning uh, participating lightning um, in. lightning around me all right so uh here, tim lynch he's a frequent viewer thanks for tuning in tim uh lenny uh any plans for seminars coming up i know you have a, a you're planning a big seminar series the chesapeake bay boat show and timonium fairgrounds come january yep what else you got <clears throat> give me a half a second here i can do this pretty quickly uh because i do have a few coming up let's see i'm going to try not to miss any all right, not November, December, must be looking in the wrong place here. Oh, okay, we got uh, January 21 to 22, Chesapeake Bay Boat Show. Um, April 5, I'll be in Frederick. Um, the, oh, I know I got more than that. It looks like January 21, we'll probably be doing one of Bosun's. That is not finalized yet or set in stone, but I think that's going to happen uh, at Bosun's Marine on, on Ken Island. Uh, I know I got more than that. Why am I not so, saying as, as they come up, we'll add them to the fishtalkmag.com forward slash calendar. So we've got a button there, so we'll, we'll make sure to get those up online and you can check back periodically. Thank you for that. I'm not great at scheduling people. I'm telling you, I'm a mess. But Tim, definitely check out the uh, Chesapeake Bay Boat Show um, in January. It's going to be year two. Really great event. All right. I did last month. Maybe those are the ones I was thinking of. Hmm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Are paddle tails still hot? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last couple of, of trips, we've been actually been doing great with paddle tails and with BKDs, straight tails. Uh, both have been highly effective. It's not yet so cold that you like need that paddle tail so you can really slow stuff up and still have action. That's what I like. You know, when it gets really cold and the fish like metaphysically slow down and just everything's happening slower, 
that's that's when I kind of like I'm like man I need a paddle tail, um, but they're yeah they're rocking it yeah. Ah uh, hey, uh, guessing hunting for structure will be hunting for fish also yes absolutely hunting for structure is hunting for fish. I haven't had much had much luck weighing north. Uh, who for I'm guessing that's where how far north. Is are there oyster beds and how do I find them? Okay, so the oyster beds there used to be. Uh, most of them have died off, uh, and then we had the freshet of what was it 2018? I think 17, 18, where all that fresh water poured down the bay, killed them all dead. Uh, they said at one point every oyster north of the Bay Bridge was dead. So northern bars are in a rebuilding phase. Now that said. Um, I believe the Maryland DNR maintains an oyster reef map. Um, not going to be real good at telling you how to find it right now, but I would start Googling it. It's out there. Uh, and then also, um, Wayne Young has a bunch of books that go into not only the reefs, but the restored uh, reef areas where, you know, maybe historically there was a reef there, all the reef, all they, oh, look, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> There's Wayne. <laughs> um, but also the restored areas where they used as reef sites, where they drop stuff like, you know, bridge parts. Um, so I'd recommend checking out his books. And as Wayne says, <laughs> if you go to the where to page on fishtalkmag.com, there's a ton in there. You can type in stuff like Northern Bay. Um, you know, I don't know. What else are you going to type in? Type in, uh, you know, Pools Island, Pools Island will pop up, you know, place names and places like that will pop up. You know, another really good resource for finding structure. This is kind of a funny one. Uh, Google Earth. Sometimes it's really helpful. Sometimes it's really not. But sometimes it's really helpful. Uh, it gives you that bird's eye view. And when you find an area where the satellite took pictures during the winter or the colder months of the year, when the water was really clear and you can really see down through it, you can see stuff you know, three, four feet underwater. Um, it depends on when the picture in that area was taken. Uh, if it was taken during a time of poor water quality, can't see squat, right? Um, but it, it, it's, it can be very helpful. I, I found some, uh, some riprap fingers on the Severn in that just that manner. It turned out to be a really hot perch spot for me a few years hmm. back. There you go. It, yeah, it's, hey, Dave. Uh, do you look for certain kinds of birds when hunting for fish? All right, so that's an interesting question. <clears throat> Absolutely. So basically, size matters. And I'm really simplifying things here, right? Uh, but the little turns you see, they'll work on just bait. No big fish. There's little turns, little white ones with black heads. The bigger gulls you see generally want bigger baits. Uh, they'll, they'll work on uh, anchovies, little baits, being chewed up by fish. And sometimes you'll see them working over just pods of anchovies, but less often. More often when you see the gulls, they're going for bigger baits. Then you have your really big birds, right? Um, your uh, not carmorants. Oh, now I'm going to blank out. Gosh darn it. Not carmorants, not frigates. Frigates offshore. Uh, but in the bay, you have your the really big ones with the black wing tips. Help me out, Zach. Uh, really big. Drawing What's blank. that? I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. Oh God, <laughs> the really big ones with the black wing tips. Um, oh man, I'm gonna. It's really embarrassing. I can't think of the name right now. Anybody? Gosh, darn anybody? It. Gannett. Gannett. Thank you. Oh thank, God. That was thank you, Mike. <laughs> thank you, Mike. <laughs> oh, there it is. Everyone's all here, Chris. <laughs> Everyone's gonna come again, 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 again. <laughs> well, spelling, there's a little bit of spelling discrepancies here. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, the get when you see the gannets, they're diving down on bigger fish even yet. So you know, gannets are great. Mix of gannets and gulls, great. Mix of gulls and turns, okay. Uh, just turns, eh, maybe you know. Like if I saw 30 turns this way and 10 goals that way, I'm going for the goals. No question about it. You know? So yeah, I'm looking for the types. Uh, and fortunately for those of us who blank out and can't remember stuff, the size relates to the types. 
Um, and I'll be interested to hear some stories about if you have working birds down in New Orleans, because David's been down in New Orleans catching way too many redfish, if you ask me. What can I say? <laughs> all right, we got about five minutes. So I have quite a few questions. Let's uh, try to get through them all. So um, here's a question from Alex. Hey, Lenny, I've read enough books, including yours, to know I have the right gear. My challenge is planning a trip and where to go. Uh, I know to look for the fastest current. So launching from Rhodes River tomorrow, how to approach where to look tomorrow? Ah, so, <clears throat> okay. A couple things. First off, thank you for reading the books. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, so River Like the Road does not have what I would call a ton of current, right? It's got a little bit of current, not a ton. Um, at times, probably on a fairly regular basis, the current created by the wind in many places will be just as important as the current created by the tide. In both cases, you're looking for something that interrupts that current. So a point that sticks out, right? Like a riprap point is prime. Um, docks that stick out and interrupt the current uh, are going to be prime in the road. Um, any, any kind of physical structure that's going to break that current counts. Now, like I said, wind in a river like the road, true of the south, the west, the Magathy, where you don't have a lot of flow coming down, it's kind of a it's pretty mellow current. Um, that wind current is really important. So if you have an outgoing tide and the wind is blowing downriver, now you're really looking for spots where that current coming down the river is going to hit something on an outgoing tide. Because now you got the tidal driven current and the wind current both working together. So now you got a decent amount of water movement, right? So a point sticking out into that, a, a pier that's sticking out into that, now you got something to work with. That's going to be really, really, really good. So that's the kind of thing I would be looking for. And good luck tomorrow. I hope you catch some fish. I have not gone up into the road recently. I've, that's, that's interesting. I Please send me a report. Let me how you do regardless. Kevin's back. The Maryland. Oh, God. Kevin, you had to bring up the young of the year. It's depressing. He says it showed another bad year for striped bass, but the spot numbers were way up. Any theory on why the spots was so strong this year? I do not have a theory on why the spot spawn was so strong this year. And I would counter by questioning, uh, was it just so bad for straight bass that it just looked horrible in comparison? Um, I, I don't have any idea why the spot spawn was strong. I will just chip in there really quick. I'm actually a little bit worried about the spot myself. When I was a kid, Every three years or so, you'd have a run of jumbo spot. I haven't seen a jumbo spot in 15 years. I mean, they used to be three-pound spot. Uh, I, I have not seen that in a long dang time. I haven't caught a spot big enough to eat in a while. It's, it's not the way it was. And some of the boats are going out there and catching 50 spot and using them all up in a day. And so I worry about them. I'm glad they had a good... Uh, strong spawn. Uh, the rockfish spawn just, it happened again. We had another crappy year. I, I don't know quite what to say. And uh, you know what? The ASMFC is going to have their say when the stock assessment comes out. We've been waiting on it. I don't know where it is. Should have been out in October. I don't know. Oh, Dave, different strong spawning strategies. Okay. I, the next time I sit down with Dave, I expect a conversation on spot spawning because I know nothing about that. I'll be curious to hear it. All right. We got, we're at 6.59. You want to go to 7.30? Uh, we can keep going. We, if we got a pile <laughs> of questions, man, fling them up there. So Fred's saying he's been seeing large purse boats seeing around Holland Point area. What effect does that have on bunker? I don't believe that's possible, Fred. Um, purse seines are illegal in all of Maryland waters, uh, with the exception of scientific permits, and those are usually like little otter trawl boats. It's likely you're seeing them do something else 
Uh, and since Dave is on, let's ask him if he has any insight into this. Are there any big boats working around Holland Point? Uh, I also want to point out uh, we had a, a guy who was really concerned in the last week email. You, you might be seeing the same thing. He was very concerned emailing about a commercial boat working in the Chester, Hall and Nets. And it, it, I actually dug deep into this until I found the boat. I found his pictures. I matched it up with the pictures of the boat. It's actually a survey boat uh, that's doing hydrographic survey work. It's towing a sonar array. Um, and I solidly confirmed that. Uh, found the Coast Guard notice to the mariners on the boat doing this work. It's also been sighted in Eastern Bay. I wonder if it's been around Holland Point, too. You might have been seeing the same thing. Uh, but if anyone else has insight on that, please chime in. But Purse Seine, man, if a boat pulled a Purse Seine in the Maryland portion of the Chesapeake, there'd be blue lights flashing in no time, mm -hmm. fortunately. I missed this question earlier. It must have come in uh, during the structure-based discussion. But uh... So Constantine is saying with Navionics, you can turn on relief shading if you're a member and find all kinds of structures. That's absolutely true. Uh, it's, it's also true that many of the latest chart ships are like shocking in their detail. They go to one foot contours. So again, I go right back to, Hey, it's current tech, modern tech that is available to you today. Why aren't you using it? You know, I, the new chip, uh, in my hummingbird, uh, I, I was kind of blown away because I had a good chart chip. Um, it was an avionics in my old unit. It was an older avionics. It was not updated. It was not up to date. But the new one is like, holy cow, one foot contours. Woo! Like, it really. Yeah. Nice. And Navionics is great. Um, you know why I like Navionics? I really like being an Navionics member for one reason. You can get off your boat and get on someone else's boat or go out on a different boat. And you can pull it up on your phone. And that's very advantageous at times. It really is. I use the uh, Navionics app on my kayak quite frequently. I know for a fact that Zach uses the Navionics app because if you remember, Zach, there was one day last year when I couldn't find something on my chart chip, and I was like, can you pull it up on Navionics? Remember that? Uh, I do, yeah. Yeah. I was like, can we figure out where the heck this thing is? And it, it my, my charts did not happen. We still didn't find it, as I recall. I don't think we ever found it, did we? Um. Yeah, the wreck. You talking about the wreck? The, yeah, the barge. Yeah, I think we found a hump. We're not sure if it, we didn't see a lot of structure, but maybe yeah, with the side, side scan, scan. We, re, we got to go re revisit with the side scan. Let's let's we do it tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, David responded with uh, the question: Purse sands have been outlawed since the 1930s in Maryland state waters. You may be seeing boats working pound nets. Pound nets are a sane net too. Um, he uh, elaborates more. Otherwise, there are some gillnet fisheries where boats have a spool and are targeting things like spot croaker and bunker. Um, David is not up to speed on all the timing and gears for different fisheries open right now, but guarantee that Lenny is right in a purse saying that certainly was not being used in Maryland. Thanks for chiming in with that, David. Yeah, I, I that I was certain of because, man, there'd be blue lights flashing. No one's going to get away with that. <laughs> Lots of reports would come in very, very fast. Like I say, the survey boat, I, I've gotten, I don't know, five emails about this survey boat within the last week, um, including one guy who was genuinely upset. He was like, how are we supposed to help these fish when these factory ships are coming in and cleaning it up? And But yeah, yeah, seining is not going to happen in Maryland. Now, if we could only say the same about Virginia, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. We're a little, little bit of ping pong back and forth here, but David said he loves uh, uses Navionics every time on his kayak, and Mike Dunlap uses the Navionics app exclusively on the EC three hundred. David also recommends screen snipping Navionics in Google Earth and layering them to look at both at once. So that's Whoa. Kind of interesting insight. Damn! I all right. You got to show me how to do that because I don't know how to do that. Are you a Photoshop, right? I do. Yeah, you can do. <laughs> All right. A um, little off base here. Gary wants to know, how much Lenny do you charge for a half day of fishing? Gary, I don't charter. I, I write 
I, I do fish talk. I write freelance. I don't charter, never have, never will. Uh, I don't need to add stress to my fishing. I just don't do it. Now, that said, you just missed the Fish for a Cure auction. What I do do is I donate trips to charity. And uh, CCA auctioned me off a trip with me uh, maybe a week or two ago. And we just auctioned off a couple for Fish for a Cure. So uh, I'm sorry. I don't charter. But next year, Fish for a Cure, tune in or watch the CCA banquets. You might see my name come up. And uh, that's that's the way to get a day with it. And also, you can go to fishtalkmag.com and go to Charter Fishing. There's several local guides that we, uh, you know, know they're extremely knowledgeable and catch a lot of fish. From yep. light tackle to snakehead to offshore to you name it. All right. Um, got a few more winding down here. If you're working the mouse, the rivers is expected. Stick with trolling the channel edges similar to the spring if you're trolling. Yeah, absolutely. The, the edges are going to be where you're looking. No question. Um, I think, didn't we talk about this on the last live with Lenny Zach? Didn't we do the, I had the chart of the Severn showing like a proposed yeah. trolling pattern? Yes. Yes. Aaron, if you go on YouTube, and look at last month's, you'll see some examples where I put up charts of the rivers and showed like what I would do if I was trolling those males. And it, but it's pretty much what you're saying. It's like trace those contours, trace those channel edges. Um, so Mike's tuning in. He must have missed the intro. Excited for pickerel yet? <laughs> I refuse to think about pickerel until December. I can't do it. It's too much going on in my head between the rockfish and like, no, 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 I can't go there yet. I can't go there yet. So in December, I'll get excited for pickerel. I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd like to go ahead and I'd like to give Michael a big thanks. I'd like to give Matt Baden a big thanks and also David Sikorsky. All these, these three, since I've been a part of Coastal Conservation Association of Maryland, these three guys have made this pickerel tour. Like Matt sort of started it, Dave and Matt, Michael, you know, they all, they've made it what it is. And, and I mean, what, what we had like 70, 70 anglers participate last year. It's just tremendous participation. So thank you for everything you did to make it what it is today. It's an awesome event. And it goes and goes and goes. It goes all winter. And I still think there should be a handicap for the guys that can fish. 120 days, four months, well, minus a few for uh, February, but, you know, come on. <laughs> I know you're, I know you're talking about. <laughs> all right. Well, um, so we're, we'll all be participating, and you can fish for, you know, crappy perch. Um, oh, yeah, there's a bunch control. of ways to win. Bass? There's, isn't there a bass one, too? I don't think it's bass. I think it's yeah. yellow perch. Is it an other? What is yellow. it? Yellow perch, white perch. Perch, crappy, pickerel. There's biggest single pickerel. Biggest There's, the longest, pickerel. Bass. There's the longest bass, Calcutta now. And then you have crappy and perch as well. There's fly, youth, lady angler. So, you know, Kayak. get the whole family out there. You can, so many ways to participate. Zach's hey, trying to keep that kayak here. category quiet. He said, no, 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 there's no kayak category. I never, I, you know, I caught five citation pickerel last year and I was like, 12th place so it's 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 <laughs> also very competitive also very competitive it hey, is yeah. it's gonna happen for you i know it will and to sign up you just go to ccamd.org forward slash pickle champion see dave i had that lined up i was it's all lined up <laughs> um so I, I i mean i love exploring the eastern shore mill ponds you know i kind of started dotting off all the delaware mill ponds and i buy a, a delaware state fishing license it's like 20 dollars for a state it's just crazy so and then you can use that at indian river in the summertime all kinds of stuff so it, it's it's just great to explore more fishing opportunities that we have within an hour two hour drive there's tons of campgrounds in delaware that are open that you can camp you can get a cabin I love it's kind of shocking. You can you can be out there in the middle of January or the middle of December and have nonstop action. You can. You'll have like 20 pick roll, three perch, five bass kind of days. It it absolutely happens. It's very cool. 
Yeah. On those balmy 40 degree days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, and we want to thank Suzuki for sponsoring Live with Lenny. Um, you can go to fishtalkmag.com forward slash Suzuki. Um, you'll find a lot of local dealers. You know, if you need winterization, if you're looking for a winter repower, all your local dealers are on that map right there. You can you can browse through and, uh, you know, as a testament to Suzuki, Lenny loves Suzuki, you know? It's just... I do. I so love that they, that they are supporters of Fish Talk. Because like I could talk about it all day. I I mm, I love the motors. I just love them, and as evidenced by the fact that I just bought a brand new boat and I insisted on putting the the Susie on it. No question. All right. Well, I think that's wrapping us up, right, Zach? Yeah, we have two more questions. You want to do two more questions? And then... Real quick, one, real quick. Come on, real quick. Aaron, Aaron wants to go back. Uh, Trolling so... speed to target for fall different than spring. The water's cooling instead of warming, so you got, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, not really. I think the most critical thing right now is going to be making sure that you're trolling your gear near bottom. Because these fish have been hanging near bottom. They come up and they bust water for 10 seconds, they go right back down. Elevator fish, right? They go right back down to the bottom. You're, you're catching them off bottom. You want those lures to be pulling just off bottom. So I would keep it slow, add some weight, uh, but more or less, yeah, not really much different. You're in the same kind of category. All right, what's the other one? Last question. This is interesting. Uh, reservoir stripers. Now, most of the reservoirs <laughs> close, I think, November 30th. I think that's right, the ones we have here in Maryland. Most of them close to fishing. But I also haven't heard much about these. You know, there's – well, actually, you know what, Lenny, let me, let me, let me tell you. Uh, Eric Packer and I did a Heroes on the Water at Rocky Gorge in uh, September, I think it was, which, you know, everyone knows they can be tough fishing. And Packard was dropping spoons down deep in about 30, 30 uh, feet of water and uh, caught like a 24-inch striper at Rocky mm -hmm. Gorge. Everyone was like, oh, my God, this, that's what happens when you bring Packard along. He catches fish. <laughs> um, but I, I've seen that there's mega stripers at, like, Liberty – in, in some of those northern Baltimore reservoirs. Yeah, I got to say, I haven't heard as much about them these days as I used to. I can't tell you that I've focused on them personally, uh, but they haven't really been popping up in the reports. Now, that said, <clears throat> I you know, years ago when I was younger, I used to target them. Liberty, Piney Run. Piney Run used to have a great population of them. Uh, I think they got caught out of there. They stopped stocking. Um, but Liberty should, it, I'm sure it's going on. Maybe people are keeping it quiet. Certainly haven't been hearing a lot about it, though. That's, yeah. Mm. Well, if, you, if anyone has any intel, please let us know. We can include in our freshwater fishing reports. It'd be cool to know what's going on up there. I know a lot of guys fish the bridges in the wintertime, deep dropping for crappy and stuff. Uh, I've tried for pickerel a few times uh, I, for the CCA tournament. I, I hit Lock Raven, you know, I catch a few, but there's some big ones in there. And there's snakeheads in there now, too. So, mm. Oh, boy. All, All right. right. That's well, a wrap. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I will see you next month, if not before. <laughs>